going to say good morning, but good afternoon. I have to remind myself that it is not the morning. For those, Travis did a bit of intro, for those that are unfamiliar with me being here today, Travis and I talked last year, and he made the request that I would come and do some teaching and sow into the understanding of the fivefold. And so we have been digging at that since last October. Amazingly, we've been at this for quite a number of times. Every time it's been different, every time we've gone a little bit of a different direction, and again today we're going to go on again a different direction. So if you want to turn, if you have your Bibles, to Ephesians 4, and it's going to be put up on the screen there so that we can, the, some key words, especially one significant word that we're going to be looking at, and again, for the fact that I've been at this since last October, We've done six, seven-ish teachings, maybe not that, five, six, something like that. So there is a fair bit of territory that we've covered. So there's probably going to be some gaps in the perspective of where we are today based on where we've been at. But as a kickoff intro, a reminder, Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm just going to start here in verse 11 and verse 12. A lot of territory we've covered, so I'm going to just very quick summary here. But it says, and he, Jesus is the he, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as, as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Now, just quick comments for context. In verse Eight, we have the reference to his ascension and at that point of his ascension he turned as he's leaving the earth his ministry is finished he's died he's rose again and as he's ascending he turns and he releases here what are referred to as gifts a particular kind of gift and he releases it back to the earth and then the last study which I believe you can get this on Facebook is that correct yeah. Where, so we dug into looking in the scriptures to see Jesus as an apostle, to see Jesus as a prophet, Jesus as an evangelist, Jesus as a teacher, Jesus as a pastor. In the New Testament, we have Jesus revealed as all five of these, and he in turn, walking in them in fullness, was able to then release them to the earth as he left and took his right hand in position before the Father. So we've looked at that, and you can get that teaching if you want it. The focus here, where we're going to move forward in verse 12, it says, for the equipping of the saints. And as I've, again, I've done this teaching already, but the, the intent of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher is not to elevate these gifts. What the church has done, the body of Christ has done, has elevated these gifts. But from God's perspective, these giftings, they're very important in why he gave them, but they're given not to elevate them, although they may be elevated in the process of what they do. But the emphasis isn't to elevate these giftings. The emphasis is actually what we have in verse 12, and that is for the equipping of the saints. In other words, God's intent, and I'm going to show you something today, drilling into this, his intent is that this is about what he is wanting to accomplish in the life of every one of his children. This is not about the fivefold, although the fivefold are part of God's plan. This is about the saints, the children of God, and what God intends for every one of them. And there's where there's a shift of our attention as to what these gifts are for. Now, God in the New Testament uses two different metaphors. One metaphor, and a metaphor is an example. It's something that points to something else. So one metaphor that we have, which I'm going to show both of these to you in the Word, but one metaphor is what we have referred to the body. The second metaphor that we have in the Bible is referred to as the building. Okay, two metaphors that are in the Scriptures. And both of them are important because they give us a picture of something that God is doing. And we can see the first metaphor here before we leave the scripture. In verse 12 again it says, For the equipping of the saints, the five are given, 
for the work of service. So in other words, for what the saints work of service is, for what the body, the people of God's work of, of service is, to the building up. And notice what it says there. It says to the building up, we have the body of Christ. So we have one metaphor right here. God's giving us the picture of a body because of what is in the picture. Well, think about a body physical. We know, humanly speaking, that I can say, well, which, which arm in your body is more important? Your right arm or your left arm? Well, the answer will be whichever one I don't have. Because the moment you lack an arm, you are now going to find out that you have challenges that you don't have right now if both arms are functioning. Well, which leg is most important? Whichever one you don't have. Because the moment you face an amputation of one leg or the other, and I don't care if you're right-handed or left-handed, the moment one of your legs is removed, you're going to find out that one became the most important because the deficiency, the lack of that leg, is now going to impact how you get up and function every single day. And this relates to every part of the body. Right internally to the internal organs. The moment you find out your liver is sick, it becomes the most important part of your body. Or your kidneys are sick, they're not functioning, if they become the most important part of your body. The lungs, suddenly my lungs are shutting down and I can't breathe like I used to breathe. Suddenly guess what the most important part of your body is? The lungs. Now the reason why I'm illustrating this is because the body that God uses intentionally is a picture because what he's wanting us to see, and you're going to see this in a few minutes in the word, but he, what he wants us to see is, I don't care if in, in body language you're an arm, right arm, left arm, you're a lung, you're a kidney, you're a liver, or any other part of the body that if you felt, you know what, this is the part of the body that I think relates to who I am. The fact is, in a generalized sense, it really doesn't matter which part you are. What matters is if your part doesn't function, then the body that it's part of is going to fail to be what it's intended to be. Amen. Let me say that again. It doesn't matter whether you're, you think of yourself as a liver or a kidney or a leg or an arm or a hand or one of your eyes, or one of your ears, or both of your ears. The moment, whatever part you associate with, the moment, whatever part you tend to represent, cease to function healthily the way you were meant to be, the body that your heart is connected to is instantly weak, suffering, and missing something that God intended. Now, why am I making a big deal of this? Is because the reality is every single part, I don't care what part you want to associate yourself as, whatever single part you happen to perceive yourself to be is vital to the purpose that God has for his body. So to land this part to you as an individual, to me as an individual, there's not one of us in this room, me included as I'm teaching you this, there's not one of us in this room that has a greater place of importance from God's perspective, regardless of the part that you associate yourself as. Now, let's be real. That's not the way the body of Christ has functioned. There's been better and there's been less is, is that a fair analysis, the way we've seen the church? Amen. And it swings into the marketplace. It's the way business operates. There's the greater, there's the lesser. That's the reality of where our world system of leadership has been. That's not the reality of God's intention. There is not meant to be a greater or lesser. There's meant to be every functioning part. Okay, there's the body metaphor. Now, if we shift over... We're going to come back to this in conclusion, but go to chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, and I want you to see the other metaphor here, but look at verse 19, Ephesians 2, verse 19, I'm going to read 19 to 22. So it says, so that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and you are of God's house. So he's speaking to every one of God's children, verse 20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself 
being the cornerstone. Now, we're going to come back to, the, to this at our point of conclusion. But all I want you to see for this moment is it says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, in Ephesians 4, we read that Jesus, when he ascended, he gave gifts, and that two of the gifts that he gave are referred to as being apostles and prophets. Now, what we've done in the church today is we've deleted these two gifts for, for various reasons. Some theologically, all well as maybe it's taught, the, the apostles ceased with the last apostles. Well, nowhere in the scripture does it say this. And in fact, the challenge is, is if the apostles and prophets are compared to, now we're into the building metaphor, if the apostles and prophets are compared to a foundation work versus walls, roofs, and all that is involved in building, well, it says to me, the moment you eliminate those who specialize in foundation, says we may have a very, very big problem. Now, we're going to come back to that before we finish. I'm just going to leave that one on the table. But look at what it says, okay? So, 20, verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building is being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into the dwelling of God and the Spirit. So now we have the second metaphor. The first one I said is a body. The second one that God uses is a building. Now, when you think about building, my son and I, in the Truro area, we own a construction company. And when you think about building, I am, because I handle the finances, I handle all the invoices. Oh my goodness, I never dreamed. There is that much detail right down to the washers, the bolts, and the nuts. And you know when you're doing the invoicing and the payment of bills, the washers and the nuts matter. And I don't mean the people, I mean the little bolts and nuts, the metal thing. Maybe there are some nuts that aren't physically on the invoice, but the nuts I'm talking about are the ones on the invoice that we have to pay for. And I've come to appreciate, because of my part in our company, of the detail in building, is that where there's a lot more detail than I'm even part of from project management, oversight, coordinating, and all that. But when I see every single email, or every, well, they come by email, every single detail, in order to handle growth and increase, we launched a new project management software last year. And, oh my goodness, it was the worst season of my life, but the best outcome of my life. It was the worst season because of all the setup that we had to do. But the outcome of it is no exaggeration. I have three separate softwares working together. And when the invoice comes through one door, the first door, there might be 10 different line items on that invoice for one particular project. Every one of those line items matter in the build because every one of them has something to do with the building that it represents, with the project that it represents. Now, thanks to our software, because you have to account for everything, now literally, whether it's one, or it's 21, or 51, or 101, it doesn't matter the number of the particular product, but now each product will go from that software through our financial software over to our project management software, and now we can account for it at a budgeting and cost perspective, but but not only that, we can account for, well, when we build, say, a house and we need this many of whatever product, well, did we need more, did we need less? Because if we needed more, then we may have lost money. If we needed less, we may have made some money. So the number of, say, two by fours matters all of a sudden. Or the number of nuts and bolts matter, as small as that item may be. Now, why am I illustrating this way? Too much detail. The metaphor, God uses is a building. I've already said the metaphor is a body, but the metaphor is a building. Well, in order to have the building as we intended, if it's a new building or a renovation, it doesn't matter. You don't have the building, the plans intend to see built unless you have every single part right down to every individual nut and bolt. You don't have what you need to get the building that is intended to be built if you don't account for every little piece and every little part. Now that's brutal in a build process when you need to capture and, and track all that detail. But think about this from God's perspective. If he's using the metaphor of a building, 
and the metaphor of the building is to teach us something about God's intent, then this means that God is telling us, just like every body part, which is the most important piece or part or product in the building of a building. Well, how do you answer that? It's the one you don't have, or it's the one you forgot to include. But you find out a year later when something isn't functioning the way it should. How is that happening? You drill in and find out, how did we miss that? And now you have a problem. You see, the building metaphor is just like the body metaphor. Really, it's not about the fivefold. It's God saying, every part that is needed for my building is absolutely critical and essential. Now, if we adopt the body metaphor or the building metaphor, just being real, the body of Christ, the church, hasn't led from a posture that every part is vitally important. Or every product that you need in the build process is vitally important. It's typically been led where a few people are important. Not getting right down to the nuts and bolts of individuals and how big of a deal they may be the game changer or the game loser to something that God wants to do. Wow. You might say, I'm nothing more than a nut. Well, you as a nut are incredibly important to God. Because when you see how the nuts play out in the build process, you find out that nut could be the difference in the build being sound and solid for years to come. So it's okay if you're a nut. <laughs> you're a power to God. Just to play on that, okay? So, so, so you get the picture. Two metaphors, okay? That's where my humor comes from when I'm lost in invoices and my brain needs, get me out of here. So this is my get me out of here moment. So I hope you can endure it. So now we have a body metaphor. I'm, I'm gonna merge between what I'm gonna call the big picture and the individual, us, okay? We have to see the big picture so we can see us, the individual, how we fit or how God plans in the big picture. So we've got a body metaphor and we've got a building metaphor. Okay, now I want us to go to John chapter one. John chapter one. And verse 14. And this is the, this is an introduction into Jesus entering into his earthly ministry. But I want us to see something here because this opens the door of, of some new understanding. So John chapter one, verse 14. John 1 verse 14. So in reference to Jesus. And the word we know is Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. Now pause there for a minute. The word dwelt there is an important word in the Greek language. It is another word for dwelt is the word tabernacled. Now the reason why tabernacled is important is because if you go all the way back to the Old Testament... God set in motion that there would be a place where his full manifestation of, pre of his presence would manifest in the earth realm. Now that's a big deal because in the garden, what was lost was the full manifestation of God's presence because of the fall of man. God had to withhold him or with himself or withdraw himself from humanity. So God spoke and set in motion with Moses I want you to build this place, a building, and this building was going to be the place where his presence would come. Okay, Exodus, we're not going there too much time to dig all that up. But the end result in the last chapter of Exodus is that 21 times Moses said, it was said of Moses, he did exactly what God told him to. It says he finished the work, the glory of God enters into the building, and he wasn't allowed in the building. Because now it's God's place, not Moses' place. Now there's the first building in the Old Covenant. Now eventually, as they were wandering in the wilderness, they set up the tabernacle, and the tabernacle would move with them as they would come and go. But built into the tabernacle, it was the, the Holy of Holies, the place which was a type of the throne room of God, the presence of God, where the manifestation of God would appear, where sin would be dealt with, where, where mankind and nation would, would, in essence, get right with God and meet with God. So this tabernacle was where the fullness of God was revealed to man in the Old Covenant. Now, all of that, that's a lot of words, 
Look at the scripture again. And the word, Jesus, became flesh, became a physical one of us, and dwelt. Now I said to you that that word dwelt there is the word tabernacled. Now that's a big deal. Because remember, I said to you that there's two metaphors. There's a body metaphor, which I showed you in Ephesians. There's a building metaphor, which I showed you in Ephesians. But now what we have here in Jesus is both metaphors are right here. Okay? So, so look at it again. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh. What is this? It's a body. The Word, Jesus, became a body. So now we have the body metaphor in Jesus. But then it says, and he dwelt, he tabernacled, he, he tented in our midst. Well, now we have the building that, that comes from the Old Covenant. So Jesus was walking around as a building. He was walking around as a body. Both metaphors that God uses to teach us his plan for the church, both of them are now seen, boom, right there in Jesus. He's a body. He's a building. Now, why is that a big deal? So what if he's a body and he's a building? Well, look what it says. The body in the building, he was among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, what happened is as Jesus, the body in the building, entered into earth's atmosphere in the ministry days of his life, everywhere the body in the building went, the manifestation of the glory went. Wherever the manifestation of the glory went, people's lives were changed in an instant because the glory met the need of humanity. So the body where God's glory came from, the building where God's glory came from, moved and impacted people. People were healed. People were set free. People were transformed. Because from the body or from the building, they met the glory that was the glory of the Father being revealed. So this body or this building is important because just sticking with Jesus, it was where the glory of God was being made known to people. And, and I'm not going to turn here, but I'll just quote it. Acts 10.38, a summary of Jesus' ministry. It says, for he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Or I could translate that and say, for the glory of God was manifested through him. So where the glory was manifested in fullness, all were healed through the body. All were healed through the building. Now they weren't healed by the body and they weren't healed by the building. They were healed by the glory that was being revealed, which was the Father finally had a place. He had a body in a building that he could reveal his glory through. And when that glory manifested, bam, people were simply changed permanently by that glory. I've shared this, I'm sure I've shared this story before, but, but when I was young, a vivid memory, when my sister had an eye disorder, it was turned in, and medically they could do nothing. And I remember the day when as a young boy with my father and my grandfather and my grandmother, my mother and my sister, we drove downtown Toronto where we lived, went to a bus depot. The three females got on the bus, we said goodbye, and they were heading off to the States. Akron, Ohio happened to be the location because there was a woman named Catherine Kuhlman. Now, Catherine Kuhlman, if you don't know who she was, she walked in a manifestation of healing that people were healed just being in the place near Catherine. It wasn't Catherine the person. It was the glory of the person, God himself. And he just healed people because he was present. Like literally, we say, well, God is with you. I mean the literal manifest presence of God. And so my sister with my mother and my grandmother, they went to the, they took a bus trip just to get her near where the glory of God was moving and healing people. Well, when they got there, the lines were so long, they finally got in the building. There was no place in the seats in the main seating auditorium. They made it in, but they got stuck in the choir loft. Thankfully, there was no choir. And so they're sitting behind while everyone's out here, she never came forward for prayer. Nobody ever touched her. Nothing physical happened to her. She came home with a straightened eye and has never had a problem since. Amen. So, 
I, I share that because I want you to get the illustration. When Jesus, the body, full of the glory, or Jesus, the building, full of the glory, came near people and needs, the needs changed because they met the glory. And that Catherine Kuhlman is nothing compared to what Jesus walked in for three and a half years. Okay, so I'd say that the body, at least in Jesus' context, is kind of a big deal. I hope you see that. The building is kind of a big deal. And, and so, so go back here, and let's just read it again. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, he dwelt, he tabernacled the building. We saw his glory. The glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, and grace and truth was realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, Jesus, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. I love it. As the body walked around full of the glory, he healed all who were oppressed of the devil. He was explaining the Father. Amen. That makes Dad pretty cool. Yeah. As the building, Roman tabernacle, walked all around and everybody was healed that, that, that had faith to say, this is who he is and I'm receiving from him. And as they received, all of them were healed. Because he was at that moment, every need he met, he explained the Father. Wow. I don't know about you, but that's the dad that I serve. I hope that's the dad that you serve. <laughs> we were years ago, actually, where we met Heather and Travis, 2016, and I was teaching on the reality of who we are before God, the reality of our righteousness. This man walks up to me. Turns out he's a pastor, and he's very upset at what I was teaching. And he said to me, I'm a pastor and I'm angry. He says, you're telling, you know, about God, who we are and God's attitude, which was a, a positive perspective because of Jesus. And he says, I serve an angry God and I teach my people that God is an angry God. And he was mad at me for what I was teaching. And I realized, well, there's really not too much that I can do. So I laid my hand on his shoulder. I prayed for him, blessed him. Father, show him you. And I walked away. What else do you do? The next day, thankfully, he wrestled with scriptures. He came back. I taught again, continued the theme. He comes to me after the service, and he says, I got some questions. I've been wrestling with God. Now he's not as angry, but he's in process. Okay, we can talk about some questions. So we, we dug a little bit. The third day, he comes to me, and he had to wait because a few people had come. And by the time I finished with the people that were there, he walks up the whole time. He's waiting at a distance, tears streaming down his face. Because by day three, he met the same father that I was serving. Yeah. Yeah. And the father that he was serving, the angry father, needed to die because he wasn't the angry. He wasn't the father that Jesus revealed. Yeah. And it was a joy to see that man convert a pastor, uh, a leader uh, of the church. Praise God. And converted to the fact that I serve a God that loves me. Well, I don't know what happened in this pulpit, but I'm sure there was some changes. But that was radical. Okay, so Jesus walked around, and everything he did full of the glory, body or building, the glory healed all who were oppressed of the devil. That's what the glory of the Father did. Jesus just happened to be the body. Jesus just happened to be the building. The glory of the Father healed all. Now, John chapter 3. I'm painting you a little picture here. And look at here, John 3, verse 34. John 3, 34. And he says, so the, the same intro to Jesus, he says, For he whom God has sent, we'll just break that down. For he is Jesus. So Jesus whom God the Father has sent. Now, we're not going down this path. We went here last time. But the Greek word there for sent is the Greek word apostolo, which is what we have in Ephesians 4, when in the first one on the list, he has gave some as apostles. Apostolo. 
So right here, we have reference to Jesus as being an apostle sent by God. Just one scripture of, of numerous. I'm just giving you that little sidebar that's not the focus of today's teaching. Okay, And whom God sent. So the apostle Jesus, sent by God, speaks the words of God. For he, the Father, gives the Spirit without measure. So now this declaration, we already read that he was a body, he's a building, he was full of the glory, explaining the Father everywhere he went. Now we're told another important thing here. He, the Father, gave the Son. So the body, Jesus the body, Jesus the building. He had the Spirit, what does it say? Without measure. There was no limitation. So what you saw in Jesus was the full picture of what you see in the Father. Amen. The full glory, the full Shekinah glory of God the Father was revealed through the body and revealed through the building named Jesus. And what did the body and the building do everywhere he went or Perhaps I can say it this way. What did the glory of the Father in him do everywhere he went? He healed all who were oppressed by the devil. Amen. That's the Father that we serve. And if you don't know him as Father in that sense, then I'm pointing you to the fact that this is the Father. He wants you to know. Him as Father, as Dad, the one who loves you right where you're at, regardless of the condition you're in. Now, this verse is important because we're going to transition to us. It says, he gives the Spirit, how does it say? Without measure, without limitation, without hindrance. Now, the word measure there is the Greek word metron. And the word metron, one way of saying it is, it's, it's space marked off. It's territory marked off. But now with Jesus, we're told the metron, the measurement, the space marked off, guess what? There was no space marked off. Amen. So everything in Jesus was the fullness of the glory of the Father. No space marked off. No limitation. Now, I brought with me today a, a measuring cup. We use this for making things. Every one of us knows what measuring tools and accessories are. I don't know what's you, but do you know what happens if you don't really follow the recipe when you are measuring off things? Usually you get a different outcome than planned. Now if you're creative in your cooking, you might get a better outcome. That's not me, so I would get a worse outcome. Okay? The point is, is that this measurement, it's just a representation. It just represents, if you're going to cook something, follow the measurements, because the measurements will determine the end product that you were trying to create. Now, Jesus, in the usage of the word measure here, this does not illustrate Jesus. There was no measure. There was no limitation. In fact, I can't even illustrate Jesus because I would need the roof to open and the waterfall to keep falling and keep falling and keep falling and keep falling like Niagara Falls. It never ends because that would be the only way to somehow to try to measure the greatness of the Father in all of his glory that was in the body or in the building. So, so this just can't illustrate Jesus. I hope you get that picture. He's, he's immeasurable. We know that if we say of God on the throne. But Jesus as a body, Jesus as a building, was immeasurable concerning the amount of glory that was in manifestation. Okay. Now, turn with me. I'm not done with the measuring cup. In Romans chapter 12. So we've seen Jesus. We've seen the body. We've seen the building. Romans chapter 12. And now I'm bringing this to us. Okay, we've seen Jesus the body. We've seen Jesus the building. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. It says, For the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think is to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each 
it says a measure of faith. Now, the better translation, because in the Greek, it's called the definite article, and the definite article typically is translated the, so really it should say, to each has been given the measure of faith. Okay? Not a, but the. Now, the context here, although faith is the subject, if, if I was to say to you, today we're going to study faith, which we're not, but let's say I said to you, we're going to study faith. We could go down so many streams of looking at faith. There's many streams of where faith studying, faith digging. I have a eight session teaching called Walking by Faith. Well, you can say there's eight different streams of emphasis to understand faith from the Bible perspective. Okay. The focus here is not the study of faith. The focus here is faith as it relates to us individually in what's been given to us by God. So let me prove this to you, then we'll come back to verse 3. Verse 4, for just as we have, sorry, for just as we have many members in one body, and all the same members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, since we have, differ, diff, since we have gifts that differ according to the great grace given to us. Now I'm going to stop there. Now the emphasis is zooming in to the fact that each one of us has been given things by God. Okay? The emphasis isn't, I want to know how my faith can move mountains and all that great stuff about faith. The emphasis is individual functioning. Now, why is this important? In Jesus, as a body, how much measure was there? Zero. No measurement. Jesus in the building, how much measure was there? No measurement. Unlimited. But now, he is ascended on high. There will never be another Jesus in the literal physical sense. He fulfilled something no one ever will ever fulfill, both in his life and in his death. But now look at, as we turn this to the believer, to you and me. Do you remember, I, we started in Ephesians 4, and I said, the, the five gifts, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body. Oh, now a body, which arm is most important? The one you don't have. This is review, hope you pass the exam. Which leg's most important? The one you don't have. It's the one that you realize I'm missing, it becomes the most important. Okay, so which body part from God's perspective is the most important? There is no more important than another, but there will be greater emphasis when one is missing or when many are missing. There's gonna be a great emphasis because the need is massive. You got half a body, you got a quarter of a body, you got 5% of the body, okay? The body is now a metaphor as Jesus was the body, full of glory. Jesus was the building, full of glory. Now we have a new metaphor in the new covenant moving away from Jesus. Now we have the body of Christ. He's the head, but he's not the arms. He's not the hands. He's not the feet. He's not the kidneys. He's not the liver. He's not the lungs. He's not the cells. And all aspects that make a body complete. He's the head. Where do we find the arms? Where do we find the feet? Where do we find right down to the cellular level of the body? Where do we find the living cells that make the body alive or maybe not so alive? Where do we find it? We don't find it in Jesus, the person. He's the head of the body. We find it in the functions that he's given to people that become parts of the body. You want a whole body, you won't get it in Jesus. He's the source. Now the body is made up of many parts that together make up the body. So you don't get the body of Christ without the individuals that make up the body. So look at this again, verse 3. For through grace was given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself as he ought, but to think so as to have sound judgment. Well, why sound judgment? Because uh, if I'm going to find out that I'm a kidney, 
best dark kidney this body ever had. <laughs> Maybe bad example, we have two. Uh, liver. I'm the baddest liver you've ever seen, body. Ha! Well, you see, don't think as to have more, you know, in other words, there's no room for pride when you realize, hey, I'm a liver. And my function makes you healthy. My lack of function or my sickness will kill you. I'm important. Yeah, the hand speaks. But every day when we get up, liver, you don't brush my teeth. <laughs> you don't keep me clean. You stink without me, liver. And the leg says, yeah, but we go places, man. Without me, we're going nowhere. Hand, who do you think you are, liver? Stupid liver. You see, we can play on the picture, but the reality is when it comes down to it, I need both legs and all functionality of my both legs. I need both arms and all functionality. I need my liver healthy, kidneys healthy, lungs healthy, and down we go. The point isn't which body part is more important. The point is that if we're going to see the body that Jesus was, the glory that manifested in that body, we're not going to see it unless the parts arise in their portion. The word faith here, I said to you, is in reference to the functionality. It says, as end of verse 3, as God has allotted or he's given to each the measure of faith. As I said, this isn't faith in relationship to moving everyday mountains in my life. This is faith as it relates to growing and developing the function that's in me by God's design. If I'm a liver trying to be a kidney, I will fail to being a kidney. I need to learn what a liver does to function as a liver. If I'm a hand and I'm not a leg, then I've got to stop trying to be a leg and find out what it means to be a hand because the hand has particular things that it's going to be great at and certain things it just can't do. So faith in this context is in relationship to what God has wired in each one of us as individuals. Now, why does this relate to my measuring cup? It says God has allotted or given to each the measure. Now, I've, I've gone big on the context, so you see this is focusing on individual function. So in other words, I've been given a measure. You've been given a measure. Now, what's different about you and I and Jesus is Jesus as the body how much measure was there? Zero. Me is a part of the body. How much measure is there? It's according to the part. It's according to the function. So there, there is a vast importance and there's incredible limitation. The importance of the liver is huge. But you can't compare that to well, is the hand more important than the liver or the liver more important than the hand? You see, they're vastly important, but then incredibly different and incredibly necessary. Faith's development, what Paul is trying to teach the believer here, is that you, you're already measured by God. You see, this isn't something you earn. This isn't something you spiritually attain to. You can't grow to this place. Whether you like it or not, the day you were born again, your spirit may have changed. Everything that happened in an instant, boom, you we're measured by God with something or some unique things that are in you that no one else is going to be able to function like you. Amen. That's a fact. Yeah. Now where faith comes is God saying, first of all, if you don't know that you've been measured, given measure, giving things for me, then you're never going to go on the, the walk, the journey to learn what that looks like in my life. You, you won't even start because you don't know. And this is why I made some comments about, I'm not here to knock churches. This is not about knocking churches. This is about establishing a biblical picture of God's intent. God's intent is not to elevate the fivefold. God's intent, I hope you're getting it, is to elevate the measures, the parts, the products that build the house. Because if you don't have every part, you'll never have the house, you'll never have the glory. You don't have all the parts of a body, you're never going to have the glory. So God's picture is not of a super pastors here in town. 
Or super apostles here in town. <laughs> or whatever gift you want to throw into that equation. Yes, the pastor, the apostle, all five are important. But they're important because they're meant to serve, helping people discover that there's a measure in their life. You are vitally important. Without you, we will miss some of the glory of God being revealed. That's the most biggest loss that we can ever have. So it's not even about you. It's important about you in function, but it's not even about you as you start the journey of saying, what's my measure, God? I remember way back in the beginning of my journey, I was asked by my sister, scaringly, she asked if I would be the MC for her wedding. And I'd never stood before an audience before. So I said yes, probably not realizing what I was saying yes to and the nerves and all that that comes with it. But as we get into the reception, as, as time went on, and every time I get back up to the podium, I realized, oh, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying this. This feels good. I like it. They're laughing at my jokes. The whole event is where, and so I grew over this reception in my comfort and confidence in being in front of people. Now, I don't know what's going on at this point. But a few days later, I'm driving with a family member down the road, still confused about the reception back last weekend. And I said, can I just share something I'm confused about? I'm a new or young believer in spiritual journey. And I just told him what happened. And I said these words to him. I said, I, I don't think it's pride. But maybe it is. But I really enjoyed what I was doing. What do you think that is? And the person I was talking to didn't have a clue. So it didn't help me any, but at least I voiced it. That was the first step. I acknowledge something's here that I don't understand. Well, leaving so much detail out as I fast forward in time, I find out now God's providing opportunity for me to get in front of people. And it was over and not too long that I began to find out people would say, you know, when, when you talk, like, I learned, like, the, the teacher began to be identified. Now, I'm not saying you was a good one. I sucked. But the teacher was there, the measure was there, wanting to come forth more and more. And then as that developed and God opened more doors and the teaching gift was growing, then one day God freaked me out. I'm driving an hour from Toronto to a place on a Friday night to teach. And the Lord speaks his word to me in prep. He says, I do not want you to open your Bible once in preparation for this word. Oh, crap. <laughs> In me, that was terror. Because I'd grown comfortable with my 12 pages of notes. Yeah. My faith was in my preparation. My faith was in my personal development. My faith was in the pieces of paper that fit nicely here. I knew 12 pages was the perfect sermon length for the perfect church service. It was down to the science. And now the Lord says to me, don't open your Bible. I can't even write, and I forget about the pieces of paper. I can't even open my Bible and find out where we're going. And so I drive all the way, of course he says this to me when I got a long drive, so I drive all the way to this church, Friday night service. Of course, I'm not feeling so great. I'm sitting in the front row, praise is going on, I'm not feeling so great. And as I know we're getting close to the end of the praise time, I'm really not feeling so great. So I sit down, and my Bible's sitting there closed, and out of fear, I sat down and I picked up my Bible and I opened it. I'm on in like five minutes. And you know when God's really loud when you're doing something that's wrong? Yeah. This was a very loud moment. And I just heard, I told you to not open your Bible. I mean, the voice of God was, I mean, he shook me. In the, nobody has a clue. I'm alone. I'm in fear. I'm in terror. God, what are you doing? So <laughs> the praise ends. The person gets up to introduce me. They have no idea what's going on. I come, I walk up the steps. They prayed for me. They had a pulpit like a chariot. So I walk around and I get in the chariots. <laughs> I got nothing. He's already prayed for me, but now I gotta pray for him. They don't know I'm praying for me. They think I'm praying for them, but I need a word from God help. And so I say, can we pray? So I sound so spiritual. It was a desperate man looking for more time. I pray. And no exaggeration as my amen came. It was like a coin dropping into a piggy bank. Poink. And I opened my eyes and I said, will you turn in your Bibles to, sounded like I was so on it. 
So I, we opened there, and I just, I don't know how I did it, but all of a sudden just taught the word. About 10, 12 minutes later, plink. Can we go over here? Let, let's look at this. And so now we're in the word over here. And a little bit of time, plink. Let's go over here. And 45, 50, 60 minutes, how on earth did an entire teaching time disappear? And I realized that the Lord literally guided me every step of the way. So it wasn't what I prepared. It was what he led. Amen. Now, there's amazing things that came out of that story I'm not going to share. Because of time. And here's the reason why I shared it. Do you know what the Lord was doing? Steve, I'm trying to develop your faith in what I put in you. Amen. And see, this isn't a rule for anybody else. I did not say anybody that has notes is therefore in rebellion to God. No. He was training me because he had shown me things about the measure in my life. So what was he doing? I want faith to develop in you. You're not going to lean on physical things or man. You're going to lean and depend on me. You're going to function in so many unique places where you don't even have time to get a word. But you have time to stand in front of the people and pray and receive what I want to deliver. And this is now what's happened. Sometimes I'm well prepared. I've written courses. Sometimes I'm somewhat prepared in the sense that I know where I'm going. The Lord will take us on the journey. Sometimes I'm going in didn't even know I was speaking. And I found out on a flash. And the Lord shows up in a moment. Because what matters is that the function of the measurement in me it's my faith walk. It's God developing me. You see, I illustrate that because every one of us have been measured off. You have right now, not we'll get someday. You have. Now, you may have, like me, standing in front of a people in a reception, haven't got a clue. And that's your starting point. But if we don't, I didn't even know that God wanted me to see that I've been measured off by him with things. I didn't even know to ask the question. So what I'm saying to you today is it's time you ask that question if you haven't asked the question. Now, if you haven't have asked the question or you think you're on the journey, then maybe it's time that God's saying, I want to develop that function in you to become greater and more full than you've ever known. Amen. Now, if you're a kidney, you're not going to get bigger than a kidney. But the development of the kidney can be to its fullness. Yeah. Or whatever the measurement relates to. Now, why is this important? Okay? Retract for a second. Jesus... One body, how much measure? Zero. Jesus, the building. One building, how much measure? Zero. So because there was no measurement, the full measure of God, the Father, in his glory. And he healed all. Because in the, in the building, there was no measurement in Jesus, the full manifestation of the glory to the building. And he healed them all. Well, I, I don't know about you, but if, if we stop right here, and I said, do you want the manifestation of the glory of God? Do you want to see that? Do you want to be part of that? Do you want to taste that and experience that and be, be a contributor to that? And I, I would hope that every one of us to some degree would say, oh, yes, man, that's what I want. Well, Solomon, go back to Ephesians chapter 4. So I said I'm showing you a big picture, then I'm bringing it to us, the individual, and then I'm going to conclude it, bringing it back to the big picture. So we're almost done. Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 11. Okay, I've read this. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body. Now, the body metaphor is the one we refer to here. Shift from Jesus to us. What does it take to have a complete body? Think natural for a minute. Forget about the church analogy. Just think medically or physically speaking. What does it take 
should have a complete body, proper functioning body. Every part functioning as they're meant to function, okay? Now, the body, apart from the head, the body metaphor is a metaphor God chose to talk to us about us. Now, I showed you that we've all been given a measure. How much measure was in Jesus? Zero. But we, the believer, with faith working in us, have been given a measure. Whatever that measure is, it doesn't matter. The fact is that you have been given a measure. Now, in order to have this body that's referred to here, it says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. In other words, if you, very simple, simplified, if you take this as the job description, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, teacher, has the same job description. We're here to help every body part, everyone that has been given a measurement. Who is that? Every child of God. We're here to help every child of God discover that they are a part, discover that they have been given a measured portion by God, find out that it's there, start the journey to grow up healthily into it and become everything that that measure is meant to be. I mean, the true fivefold from God's economy to us. Forget about what the church has done. The true fivefold, the apostles down to the teachers, is designed by Jesus to help the parts, the measured ones, find their part, arise in their part, and do you know what? Eventually, they're going to get out of the way because of the parts of the body that are now dominating. How's that for a picture of the church? It's not centered on a pastor or centered on an apostle. Because ultimately, if we take Jesus the body and Jesus as the, bu and as the building, what manifested in the body. The manifestation of the glory of the Father. What manifested in the building? The glory. What did that glory do? At the end of the day, even the parts disappear. Because the glory of God is in such manifestation that I don't care what part was the key one at that moment of breakthrough. What matters is the glory of God just simply healed and delivered and set people free. That even the parts where we fought for suddenly, who prayed that prayer? I don't remember. Because we get so caught up in what God did as the paraplegia got up and ran around the building. You forgot about the one that prophesied when they broke through into something that they had no way of knowing, but the person's need was broken open in a way that now they met God because suddenly they can understand Him and all of the stuff that they've been going on. You see, when we get to this point, even the parts of the body aren't going to matter because the glory. The glory. Now look at, look at verse 13. I didn't read this. We stopped purposely. It says, until we all, that's all the parts, all the measured ones, measured off ones, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. What did Jesus walk in in his physical body? He was the fullness of the glory of God. Now he's the head of a church, of a body, and we're being told, this is what, see, the, the church will not end. This era will not end until this body appears on the earth and it's not centered on one person and what one great person has done, it's going to center on the body where the glory of God is so much in manifestation that all of a sudden we're seeing the God healing all who are pressed to the yes. devil. Lives change, people heal, marriages restored. Just instantaneous aspects of God divinely intervening in people just because the glory is allowed to manifest because it's no longer about the people, it's about the person. His glory is revealed. Now this is the picture. But you can't get the glory, the end result, without getting the parts. Or the measured off ones. You can't get the measured off ones without a commitment from fivefold gifts that say we're here to help 
to measure off ones find out that they've been measured off and marked by God and they've got things in them that he wants them to arise in. You're never going to see the parts arise until you have leadership that says that's what we're committed to help see develop. Well, the beauty in my context here is Travis and I have had many conversations over the years on this. And he asked me, as he stepped into the leadership role here, he asked me, will you come and begin to teach on this? Because he knew where I would be going and I knew where his heart was. They were the same. I'm just a teacher of the heart that I knew he had. And, and Solomon, same thing, walking in the heart of this. So the beauty, as I'm teaching you this, is I can at least tell you in this place, there is a desire and there is a commitment for the part that you are to find out how important you are and to grow and rise to the fullness of that part. I can tell you that's the intent here. That is the heart of God that is meant to be. Now, as I conclude, go back to chapter 2, Ephesians. And I, I want to end it on something because I, I just felt coming in today that the Lord, there, there was going to be a bit of teaching on us, the individuals, the measured portion we are, and all that. And I knew that this teaching had to have the individual component in it. I could drill and we could go hours just on looking at us, the individual. Okay, so that's not what today's teaching assignment was. We could have gone a lot deeper. But I knew I had to bring some of that in to not lose that when I end with where we're at. So look at, so we've, we've, I've majored a little more on the body metaphor, but we talked about the building metaphor. So look at chapter 2 again. And we're going to end where didn't start here, this was the second scripture. But look at here, verse 19. So then you so this is to every one of us as believers, so that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. You are of God's house. Now, the metaphor here is the building. And write down, if you're a nut, you're a nut. You're part of the building. Okay? You can appreciate that from earlier. It's easy. Okay. So write down to the nuts, the two-by-fours, the shingles, the windows, the sealants around the windows. All aspects of what it takes to build something properly that will sustain for longevity. It says, you are of God's house. In other words, you in the house, the building, are one of the parts. You're one of the products that it takes for the house to exist. Now, which product is the most important product? The ones you don't have or the ones you forgot to include. So, if you don't know that you are a product of God's design to contribute to the house, well, you just don't matter in your head. But from God's point of view, if you're the nut that's missing in the build, and that nut never gets put into the right place, then that nut missing can mean the whole building eventually collapses. Or when the heavy winds come, it doesn't sustain because there's some things missing. It wasn't reinforced the way it was supposed to. Okay, so every one of us are a part of this house. Pause. Jesus was the builder. What was the limitation in him? What manifested in the building? Jesus. The glory. What did the glory do everywhere it went? Okay, you and I are a measured portion. There is a limitation within us concerning our function, but our function is vitally important because if our function as a product in this house doesn't function, something of the house is missing, and if you're missing parts of the house, you won't see the glory because the glory fills the house. Verse 20. Having been built, this house, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Let me read it all, and then I'll bring my concluding comments. Verse 21. In whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, 
in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now let me just simplify this. The picture is that this built house is where the glory of God dwells. Now what did the glory of God do when it dwelt the house named Jesus? He healed all who were oppressed with the devil. So what do you think the glory of God in the house called God's now house, what do you think the glory of God might do if the glory was revealed? Heal all who were oppressed by the devil. You see, God's not changing. He's not the one that's changed. We're to come into alignment with him because he wants to reveal, like he did through the house Jesus or the body Jesus, he wants to reveal through the body of Christ or now the house that we're all parts of. He wants to reveal the same glory. In verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, I'm, I'm bringing this airplane down. I've taught enough today of the individual function and how important every person is. I hope you've heard that. I've taught on the fact that Five gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, were given by Jesus in the birth of the church. Where they're very important in what they do, God never intended their elevation to make it about them. They're there to serve what is God's primary emphasis, which is the individual parts or the products it takes to build the house. That's every member of the body. Because the real intention isn't even the parts. The real intention is the glory. And you forget about the parts when the glory just manifests. We have deleted from the body of Christ the apostles and the prophets. Now, in some cases, theologically, they've been wiped right off the slate. They don't exist. So in some cases, they're just gone and not to be part of today. That's a literal deletion. Others who wouldn't go that far and delete them literally like, whoa, there's no apostles and prophets today, they're all gone. So someone who wouldn't go that far when it comes to the practicality of the apostles and prophets. We deleted them from their function within the house. Well, according to this scripture, the house is built from a foundation. But the foundation is determined by those who specialize, spiritually speaking here, in the work of an apostle or the work of a prophet. If you delete two, which happen to be the foundation functioning gifts, from the equation of God's building process to help the parts find out their parts to rise up so that we can eventually see the glory. If you delete the two that are the foundation establishing two and you're trying to build something using lots of scriptures, you're never going to get near the intent that God has. Now why today, coming in today, and I just felt the Lord stirring in my heart, this is why I had to go down a bit of the path on, on emphasizing the individual, because this is not to elevate the apostles and prophets and make them more important. That's why I had to teach what I taught enough so that I can end it with where I believe the heart of God wants to end. And where the heart of God wants to end is while in no way are we bringing down or diminishing the individual parts that is all of us and many more from finding out their part, there is a cry coming from the heart of God for the restoration of the apostle gift and the prophet gift to come properly back in in their fullness of function. So the house that will be built will actually be built according to the plan of God. Amen. Now, what I've just said, by some, they will kick me to the curb and say, that was a heretic, don't listen to what word he says. Some will take that position. And for them, no dispute, no fight, walk on. But to those that at least sympathize that I don't believe God eliminated these gifts, I believe that we're in a critical, critical moment in 
this land, a critical time and season in this land, if we're going to see the dreams that have come from God into the heart of people to come forth in their fullness, we're not going to see it if we don't go on a journey of seeing back, brought back in the undeleting of the apostolic and prophetic ministry. I'm not going to share my story here, but I'll just tell you the attempt to figure me out in a deleted context near took me out. I was shockingly connected to a conference in March from the other side of Canada, well-known leaders who basically were spewed out of our country years ago, spewed out of their own house that God used them to raise up. And I was stunned when the Lord said, I want you to listen to, well, I had no idea what I'm going into, but I want you to just listen. And I was stunned as I listened. The reason why they got kicked out was because the leadership that were established in a now growing, developing ministry basically deleted them because we don't need the apostolic, we don't need the, the prophetic, and move them out so we can now do what the church is supposed to be. Well, the whole thing, of course, crumbled to nothing. They were wounded. They were destroyed for a season. God has healed and restored them. But I was stunned to hear that their story was the same as my story. The blessing for me is they had a whole lot more leaders in the body of Christ walking with them. But yet it still failed. So over there in Western Canada, there's something going on right now where God is bringing back a word to restore things that have been lost. Well, bless, Lord, Western Canada. Amen. Okay? Bless them. But our stewardship is Eastern Canada. So this is not about Western Canada. This is nothing negative about their journey. Nothing about it at all. It's just the similarities surprise me. Our stewardship is Eastern Canada. And what I came in today with on my heart, and I'm going to pray this. I don't know what God's, you know, using the measurement illustration. I don't know what God's measure is for Moncton. But I'll tell you this much. At least in part, in God's measurement, Moncton is meant to be on a journey to reestablish the apostolic prophetic in the church in Atlanta, Canada. That measure exists. To whatever degree of fullness God's plan is, I can't speak to that without a word from the Lord, let him develop it. But the restoration is something that God has marked this city to move, I'm going to say back towards, because I think there was attempts in history. But not success. A lot of misunderstanding. A lot of confusion. So I'm here as I, as I conclude to paint the picture. But also to just a simple conclusion. Which I invite you to join me if in your heart you can agree with this. I want to conclude by simply praying. Lord, despite all the confusion. Despite all of man's failures. And man is male, female. People's failures. Despite all of that, you are here to restore and even establish something that has never been seen before. And that's what I want to pray. And if you're able to agree, I'm going to assume that you're a part, using the body metaphor, of however that comes into its fullness. Or, using the building metaphor, you're a product that is so essential the building could fail if your product, you, do not rise up. So, whichever metaphor you more connect to, the point is, you're very important and probably even part of what God is wanting to do. Father, we position our hearts and take your word. And we're not going to delete things from it, we're just going to align and agree with it. Father, you gave to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And not one of them is more important than the other. They are all essential in their function to see the glory that you intend. So Father, we, we pray on behalf of this city that Lord, for anything that man has done, mankind, Male, female, 
We just declare in Jesus' name that any, anything that man has done in this city that has come against this heartbeat, we just declare that there is a cleansing today. We release grace to every voice that is spoken contrary, whether literally or practically. We just release the grace of God, the grace of heaven upon everyone. And we say that forgiveness of heaven is, is in manifestation. And we just cancel now every resisting word, rejection, every idle word said in jest or every intensive, intending word to cut down. We just cancel every one of those words. And I speak now over this city. And I see a hard ground, but I see a soft ground. And so I say to you, hard ground, in Jesus' name, that you are not remaining hard. You are turning soft. I declare that when the enemy came in to create a hardness, the Spirit of God is moving and he is creating a softness. He is creating a new ground for the seeds of God's kingdom and intent to be planted again, established in a way that they can begin to grow and fulfill everything that the kingdom of God intends. So I, I prophesy to the ground when I say hard ground, you are becoming soft. And I speak to this land of Moncton. Hard ground, you are becoming soft. There is an allowance for the apostolic prophetic to come back in where it's been removed. There is a restoration of the fullness of all five gifts functioning as God intended. And I say that the metron, the measure of Moncton, is not limited to Moncton, but it is going to establish metrons all over Atlantic Canada that will play a part for where this nation will go. So in today's hour, hard ground, I say you are soft. Now come, kingdom of God, move afresh and open doors, open hearts, so that your intent for the body of Christ can come into a fullness in our land that we've never seen before. And we want, Father, your glory. Yes. Where we just need to do nothing yes. but be present with your glory yes. as lives are changed in an instant. Yes. God, that's what we want. That's the yearning. That's where you want us to be. We're saying we want it. Yes, God. So, Lord, take, I pray for Solomon, I pray for Travis and the leadership team, take the hand of the leadership of this body and help them to continue forward on this path of this being established. We thank you, Father, for this. In Jesus' name, amen.